evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming out this evening. Can you hear me okay in the back? Good. I, I have a microphone. Would you prefer that I use that? Yeah. All right. Yeah. I can use that. Is that better? Is that better? Yeah. All right. No. It's, it, okay. There we go. All right. Uh, so my name is Douglas Kreese. I teach philosophy at Gonzaga, and I serve on the executive board of the Gonzaga Faith and Reason Institute, which is a sponsor of this evening's presentation. The Faith and Reason Institute, now, excuse me, now 21 years old, is dedicated to developing an integrationist understanding of faith and reason through investigations pertaining to philosophical theology. So we seek to achieve this integrationist end through curriculum enhancement efforts, scholarly research, and public programs such as this evening's lecture. The director of the Faith and Reason Institute at Gonzaga is Professor Brian Clayton, also of the philosophy department. Our program this evening is co-sponsored by the Gonzaga Socratic Club, which pursues arguments pertaining to philosophy and Christian faith. Modeled on the famous Socratic Club at Oxford University, Gonzaga's Socratic Club has as its motto, to follow the argument wherever it leads. The founder and organizer of the Socratic Club is Professor David Calhoun, also of the philosophy department. <clears throat> In the past, the Faith and Reason Institute has sponsored public talks and conferences on such topics as physics and the God of Abraham, J.J.R. Tolkien and Christianity, Faith, Reason, and Suffering, and The Church and Her Scriptures. This evening, we are taking up a topic new to us. There has been an ongoing debate among historians and students of politics about whether the United States was founded in the tradition of Enlightenment philosophy, such as that of John Locke, or in the tradition of Christian faith, such as that of the Puritans? Of course, the answer of all integrationists is both, but was one or the other predominant? Tonight, then, we begin to explore the topic of faith, reason, and the founding. There are two auspices in favor of this evening's topic. The first is that, while we didn't really plan it this way, we are taking up this question on Gonzaga's own Founders' Day. Secondly, last month on Constitution Day, the National Endowment for the Humanities, NEH, announced that it will begin funding a series of programs preparing the nation for the 250th celebration of the American founding, which anniversary will arrive on July 4th, 2026. Somehow then, we have even gotten the jump on the federal government. Our lecturer this evening took his doctorate appropriately from the University of Virginia, which was established, of course, by Thomas Jefferson himself. He currently is the Her Herbert Hoover Distinguished Professor of Politics at George Fox University, among other things, teaching there in the William Penn Honors Program. He is also affiliated with the Center for the Study of Law and Religion at Emory University, with Baylor University's Institute for Studies of Religion, and with the John Jay Institute. And he directs the John Dickinson Forum for the study of America's founding principles. I figure he's in a very good position to apply for some of that NEH money I just mentioned. Professor Mark David Hall is also the author or editor of a dozen books on the American founding, three of which are being released in 2019. I am just beginning to study one of these on the just war tradition and America's wars, 
with my upper division philosophy seminar students. The book that attracts our interest tonight, however, has the same title as this evening's talk. Copies of the book, Did America Have a Christian Founding, are for sale by the GU Bookstore just outside the auditorium. And yes, Professor Hall will sign copies after his book and the ensuing Q&A session. Please welcome to Gonzaga, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Mark David Hall. Well, thank you very much, Doug. Is this, is this still on? Can you hear me okay? Yes, no? It's pretty close. Pretty close. Okay, is that better? All right. Well, thank you very much, Doug, and thanks to the Institute and, and to Gonzaga for hosting this. It's a real honor to be here and to, to share a little bit about my book with you this evening. So there are two problematic answers that are oftentimes given to the question, did America have a Christian founding? One is by popular Christian authors from the 19th century to the present day, oftentimes authors without academic credentials who overstate the influence of Christianity on America's founding. Uh, all of America's founders were good godly men. They intentionally created a Christian nation. Uh, maybe they were even evangelical Christians. Um, sometimes these scholars uh, misuse sources. Sometimes they make up stories. I have in mind here Parson Weems and his literary um, vision of George Washington kneeling in prayer in the, in the snow at Valley Forge. It just never happened. It's nonsense. So I'm not defending this position, but I'm not really as concerned about this position. What I'm far more concerned with is there are book after book by prominent scholars, by jurists, by popular authors, arguing that the answer is a resounding no. America did not have a Christian founding. America was founded by enlightenment rationalists who created a godless constitution, who went on to strictly separate church and state. Um, these claims are very, very common, and um, I, I take a number of them to task in my book. The book has five substantive chapters, and I set each one up with about two dozen quotations of people saying things like, most of America's founders were deists, or America's founders created a godless constitution. And then I hope, I, I, I'd like to think I demolish uh, these claims, these false stories. What we'll do tonight, though, is we'll explore the question a little bit. Did America have a Christian founding? Let's begin by considering what a Christian founding would look like. How would we know it if we saw it? And then we'll shift and talk about when America was actually founded. So what, so what do we mean by a Christian founding? Closer? Oh my, okay. <laughs> In between, we'll try to do the best. Our best. All right, so um, what would a Christian founding look like? Well, one, one way to approach the question is we might say, would the founders have identified themselves as Christians? If this is what we mean, then we indisputably have a Christian founding. About 98% of Americans of European descent in the late 18th century are Protestants. The other 2% are Roman Catholics. You have about 2,000 Jews in four American cities. So definitely overwhelmingly self-identified as Christians. But this isn't a very interesting finding, it seems to me. Uh, they could be unorthodox Christians, they could be unpious Christians, or they could be Christians influenced by profoundly secular ideas. So I'm going to just uh, consider this, but put it to the side. Another thing, and it would be a more interesting finding, is that America's founders were orthodox Christian, Nicene Creed, Apostles' Creed, believing Christians. Um, if this is what we mean, it, that, that would be more interesting, but it's also really, really hard to know with respect to many founders. Now, we know for sure that a few founders, like a Thomas Jefferson or John Adams, rejected some basic tenets of Orthodox Christianity, the divinity of Christ, for instance. Now, they did so in private documents. They were very careful to keep their, these views from the public, um, from public view, but we know for sure that they are not Orthodox Christians. And I think we can say that we know for sure that some, a Samuel Adams, a Roger Sherman, and Patrick Henry were Orthodox Christians, but in many, many cases, we just don't have the sort of documentary record we would like to make this determination. We might know that a founder was a member of a church, maybe a vestryman, but we can't really dive very deeply into the orthodoxy. 
A, a third possibility is, the, um, is what historians sometimes call orthopraxy. Did the founders act like Christians? And sometimes the argument is made, well, someone like an Alexander Hamilton had an extramarital affair, and that's a bad thing. And it is a bad thing, and it's a very unchristian thing. But I'm not sure what that tells us necessarily. It doesn't, certainly doesn't mean he's a deist. It doesn't necessarily mean he's not a Christian. And I'm not sure how that um, impacts his political contributions in the American founding. So what I want to do, and we could spend more time talking about these, but, and I talk about a few others in the book, but I want to jump to my conclusion that the best way to think about the question is in terms of influence, intellectual influence. And here I'm in very good company. Scholar after scholar has written book after book arguing that America's founders were, in, founders were influenced by Lockean liberalism or the classical Republican tradition or the Scottish School of Moral Sense. And so what I want to do is put Christianity on the table and look at the influence of Christianity and of ideas developed within the Christian tradition of political reflection. And I think here an argument can be made, a very good argument can be made, that America had a Christian founding. Let me turn to the question of founding. When was America founded? Now, I, I think our minds naturally go to the late 18th century, but I want to suggest a possibility that one could argue that we should begin with the earliest colonial settlements. Um, you had these settlements of England particularly that developed over time, and you had these centuries of basically self-governance. And if we really want to understand the story of America, we should perhaps understand its colonial origins. Well, here I don't think anyone would really argue with me about New England. Um, New England is self-intentionally attempting to be a city upon a hill, Biblical passages are incorporated wholesale within the statutes and this sort of thing. Um, but the story is oftentimes told, well, yeah, fine, in New England they were interested in, in God, but in the South they were interested in gold. And they came looking for gold, and when they did not find gold, they found tobacco, and so it was a commercial colony. And there, of course, is some truth to this, but I, I, I want to emphasize that um, this might be a bit... Overblown. Let me read uh, from a passage from Virginia's first legal code, 1610. Whereas his majesty, like himself, a most zealous prince, hath in his own realm a principal care of true religion and reverence to God, and has always strictly commanded his generals and governors with all his forces wheresoever to let their ways be like his ends for the glory of God. The statutes go on to mandate daily church attendance and to punish people who blaspheme God with death. I mean, you read through this and you might think you're reading the worst sort of um, theocratic um, legal code from New England. This is Virginia. And even if we move to the Mid-Atlantic colony, so I teach at George Fox University. George Fox is the founder of the Quakers, um, the Friends, the Society of Friends, and we're awfully proud of William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania, this bastion of liberty, and it is in many ways. And yet, look at this uh, one law. We could talk about other things. I just quote from this law. I like reading this law to my Quaker friends. Um, this, this leads, uh, this list, offenses against God that should be punished by the magistrate. And these offenses include swearing, cursing, lying, profane talking, drunkenness, obscene words, incest, sodomy, stage plays, cards, <laughs> dice, May game, gamesters, mass, rebel, bullbiting, cockfighting, bear baiting, and the like, which excite the people to rudeness, cruelty, looseness, and irreligion. So my contention is, if we consider America to have been founded in, in, with these earliest colonial settlements, I think an excellent case can be made that America had a Christian founding. Uh, but I think it's an easier case. So I want to move on to a couple of harder cases, the War for American Independence. Now, this is arguably problematic, right? If you know your Bibles, you know Romans 13, let every soul be subject to the governing authority. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. And traditionally, the church has certainly interpreted the, these verses and other verses like them to say, no rebellion. Um, if the government tells you to bow down and worship Baal, well, you don't do it, but you take the consequences. You don't get to rebel against a tyrant. In the 12th century, some Catholic thinkers started fooling around with this idea that, well, maybe we can kill tyrants. This didn't really go too very far, too very quickly in that tradition, but within Protestantism, and particularly within Reform Protestantism, it took off. And people are a little confused here sometimes because they look at Calvin, and Calvin in his Institutes talks about inferior magistrates in some circumstances having the ability 
to check a, a king who becomes a tyrant. But what's important to note is Calvin is one of the more conservative of the reformers. Even as he's making this argument, you have John Knox up in Scotland saying, no, 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 the people themselves have, have a, a, a right, maybe even a duty to overthrow tyrants. And within this tradition, you have people like John, like Pone, Rutherford, the author of Wendy Dicke, Contos Tirannos, and others. So that by the time you get to the late 18th century, you have this very robust resistance ideology developed within the Protestant tradition that they at least thought, and I'm sympathetic to this argument, is um, in agreement and maybe even required by scripture. Now, this is particularly important in the American context because 50 to 75 percent of Americans in this era are, are reasonably called Calvinists. They're worshiping at Congregationalist, Presbyterian, Dutch Reform, and other Calvinist churches. So it's a very prominent tradition um, in America at this point. Um, let me contend as well that one of the um, key documents coming out of the War for American Independence, the Declaration of Independence, it seems to me that a key argument here rests upon a theological proposition. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, you might object that, wait a minute, this was drafted by Jefferson, and Jefferson is not an Orthodox Christian, and you would be right about that. Although the painting, I was discussing the painting on the cover of my book, that's actually the, um, it involves the Declaration of Independence, and you have the five-member committee that drafted the Declaration, presenting it to the president. So we need to remember that Jefferson did not act alone. He was part of a committee, and then the Congress took his document and changed it in ways that he didn't like, including adding references to the deity. So I think when we interpret a document like the Declaration, we cannot interpret it in the light of one man's views. We have to understand it as a product of a community, and I think an excellent case can be made that for the Congress, the creator, nature's God, this was a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a God that certainly intervenes in human affairs. Well, let us press on then to another hard one. And so the argument there is if we want to consider America to have been founded in the war for American independence, I think you can make very good arguments that the um, War can be justified in biblical and theological terms. But let's move on to uh, the Consti Constitution, which some um, academics have called a godless constitution. Isaac Kramnik and R. Lawrence Moore are actually two pretty prominent professors at Cornell who wrote this book a couple of decades ago, arguing that America has a godless constitution. At one point, uh, at one level, they have an obvious point to make, and that is that the deity really isn't referenced in the, in the Constitution, right? Not until you get to the date line in the year of our Lord, 1787. And yet this is a way that documents were routinely dated. So I would not want to rely too much on that. There is an assumption that um, it would be a Christian people governed by this Constitution. So for instance, a pocket veto occurs um, 10 days after Congress sign, uh, passes a piece of legislation, Sunday's exempted. There's an assumption that you won't do legislative business on the Sabbath. The, the Constitutional Convention met every day of the week except for Sunday. I think prior to the 20th century, the U.S. House of Representatives only met one time uh, on the Sabbath. This is just not what people do, right? So there's this sort of um, assumption. On the other hand, you have Article 6, which bans religious tests for office. In 1787, 11 of the 13 states had religious tests for office, and we said no. We aren't going to have that for the Constitution. So what's going on? Well, one might argue that we have a godless Constitution. One might argue that, but you ought not to argue that, because it's not true. If we go back to influence, thinking about influence, I think you can make a very good argument that the authors of the Constitution, the men who ratified the Constitution, were influenced by Christian ideas. Um, before I get there, let me make a point. Uh, these are Protestants. Protestants making political arguments. Protestants are people of the book. And so one would expect them to use the Bible in making these sorts of arguments. A few years ago, a political scientist named Donald Lutz did a real interesting content analysis of the political literature of the American founding. He went through a bunch of documents, came up with a sample, and he counted citations. And what he found is a Bible was referenced by far and away more than any other text. In fact, if you take all the citations, 34% are to the Bible, 22% to all Enlightenment texts combined. 
So John Locke, Montesquieu, Bakare, Smith, you put all the Enlightenment thinkers together, 22% of the citations, um, the Bible alone, 34%. But it's important to note that Lutz undercounts references to the Bible, and he does so for two reasons. First of all, he excludes political sermons that don't also have citations to secular thinkers. And um, but secondly, he is only looking at citations, the actual citations, whereas Americans in this era paraphrase scripture all the time, literally all the time, and didn't add the citation because it wasn't necessary. Everyone knew the Bible, their Bible. And I will um, give you a few examples of that as we progress. So let, let me mention quickly four different ways that the um, founders were influenced by their Christian convictions. Now let me hasten to say that what I'm about to say, these ideas are not distinctly or uniquely Christian. One could come to the conclusion that humans are sinful or self-interested for all sorts of reasons, right? Maybe just simply observing your fellow human beings. Um, but I think the best way to understand these, and I, I tease this out of my book, as you might imagine, is in the late 18th century, why did they come to the conclusion that humans are sinful? Because they were profoundly influenced by Christianity, and particularly by Calvinism, which of course emphasizes the depravity of human nature. Now, this sounds kind of nasty, but it actually resulted in some pretty good things. Enlightenment thinkers at the time, some of them, were arguing for a strong central government run by experts, right? Because, of course, you'd want the experts if you're, if you're men of reason. America's founders said concentrated power is a very dangerous thing, even if you have so-called experts. And so they came up with a, a constitutional order characterized by the rule of law, separation of powers, checks and balances, federalism. They were very aware of this sort of concentrated power. And I think, um, in part, their, their, their pragmaticness here, their awareness of human sinfulness um, helped us to avoid the bloodshed that became the French Revolution. Um, secondly, they believed in moral standards. God ordained moral standards. If you read something like James Wilson's lectures on law, you will think you are reading St. Thomas Aquinas. He says there are two types of law, divine law, human law. There are four types of divine law, eternal law, celestial law, moral law, natural physical laws. There are two types of human laws, domestic and international. Human law must be in agreement with divine law, and moral law specifically. An unjust law is no law at all, he quotes St. Saint Augustine as saying. So this is, this is just throughout the American founding. Every single Supreme Court justice prior to John Marshall, with one exception, is clearly on record saying that a federal court could strike down an act of Congress if it goes against the natural law. That's quite an extraordinary claim to make. All right, let me, um, number three, the founders' understanding of liberty must be understood in its Christian context. Founder after founder would say things like this, liberty must never be used but within the bounds of right and duty. Or even more common, law without liberty is tyranny, but liberty without law is licentiousness. The founders distinguished between liberty and license. And so if we hope to have any uh, understanding of what the founders were attempting to protect in the First Amendment say, we have to go back and understand how they viewed liberty. Most of us grew up thinking about liberty in a John Stuart Mill sort of approach, right? I'm free to do whatever I want except for physically harm you. The founders had a very different approach. Um, finally, and I think very, very critically, the founders were convinced that humans are imagers of God, created in the Imago Dei. Let me read to you from a U.S. Supreme Court opinion, Chisholm versus Georgia. Um, James Wilson, again, writing, writes this, Man, fearfully and wonderfully made, is a workmanship of his all-perfect creator. I'm sure many of you all caught that's a reference to Psalm 139.4. But it's also a reference that Donald Lutz would not have caught because James Wilson didn't bother to put in Psalm 194 in, in parentheses after he wrote um, this, this passage, after he para paraphrased um, the Bible here. And again, the founders did this sort of thing all the time. Now, Wilson, again, if you go to his lectures on law, he teases out what are the implications of this. Well, in part, one of the implications are is that life must be protected from when it first stirs in the womb to its natural end. And he specifically talks about suicide. Do you have a right to kill yourself? No, of course not, he says, because you, will, you do not own yourself. You are owned by God. God gave you life, only God 
should be able to take away your life. Um, again, the Imago Dei, we could spend a lot of time fleshing that out. We can return to it if you'd like. Let, let, me, let me get a little bit more practical. So a lot of what I've talked about, I, I think they're interesting questions or questions of historical significance, perhaps. Uh, but my wife's always challenging me to be practical. So let me turn to something a little more practical, religious liberty and church-state relations. The U.S. Supreme Court here in 1947, um, in a very powerful set of opinions, um, Wiley Rutledge for the dissent, Hugo Black for the majority, insisted, they absolutely insisted that we must interpret the First Amendment in light of the founders' views. Let me see, I'm trying to find my quotation here. Um, I got lost somewhere. Anyway, it basically they said no provision in the Constitution um, is, it must be interpreted in light of the, if it's generating history more than the First Amendment. Right? We have to turn to America's founders to understand what, the, the, particularly the religion clauses. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. What do these mean? We have to go to the founders. Hugo Black and Wiley Rutledge are uh, considered by just about everyone to be jurisprudential liberals or progressives. And, and since 1947, pretty much every justice has followed suit. Judicial liberals are actually slightly more likely to cite um, American founders or founding era history as are judicial conservatives, but they cite a very different history. They cite a history that would purport to say that there's a wall of separation between church and state. Um, there isn't. Let me, let me just talk about three areas of agreement. And again, when, you, when you're talking about originalism, the requirement is not that everyone in the whole era agreed with something, right? Obviously, there's winners and losers. There's Federalists and Anti-Federalists. The Anti-Federalists lost, so we have a Constitution, right? So with respect to religious liberty, church-state relations, I think you can find three broad areas of consensus, and I'll run through a few of those. Um, the first one is that religious liberty, or what many American founders called the sacred right of conscience, is very, very important and must be protected. A great example of this comes out of Virginia. George Mason, Article 16 of the Virginia Declaration of Rights, um, his draft read like this, that as religion or the duty which we owe our divine and omnipotent creator, and the manner of discharging it can be governed only by reason and conviction, not force or violence, and therefore all men should enjoy the fullest toleration in the exercise of religion. According to the dictates of conscience, unpunished and unrestrained by the magistrate. Now note, I, I hope you know how this argument too is grounded on a theological proposition that we have a duty to our divine and omnipotent creator, that this duty must be freely exercised. Therefore, we have religious liberty. This is a very good draft, but it actually is not the draft that became law. A young James Madison objected to the word toleration in this draft. He said, yeah, this kind of implies that it's a gift of the state that might be withdrawn. Instead, he proposed language to the effect that we have a natural right to worship God according to the dictates of conscience. And the convention agreed with Madison and uh, Article 16 was, was amended in this fashion. By the end of the Constitution-making era, every state had significant religious liberty protections in its statutory law and slash or constitution, uh, protections that oftentimes include religious accommodations to protect religious minorities such as Quakers and Mennonites and others. And we might talk about that later. Let me talk about another area of consensus. Now, this was a little bit more debated, and it's important for me to address because one argument might be against my position. Well, look, call if America had a Christian founding, why are states disestablishing state churches? And they are in this era. They're beginning to. A process that begins really in 1776 and concludes in Massachusetts about 1833 or so. The reason, though, I think is important and oftentimes misunderstood. Um, now, let's go to um, Virginia, because these debates are, are the best known. A fellow named Patrick Henry is very worried that the government has gotten out of the business of funding religion. Beginning in 1776, the government was no longer taxing to support an Anglican church. And he had what he thought was a pretty fair idea. He said, look, why don't we tax people to support the church they choose to attend? So we won't tax a Presbyterian to support the Anglican church. We'll tax the Presbyterian to support the Presbyterian church and the Anglican to support the Anglican church and so on. So that's a pretty generous sort of uh, establishment. And he justified this. And people justified it by saying, look, we, we need 
be able to pay ministers a good salary. Because if we don't, the best and the brightest young men will go on and become doctors or lawyers or something like that. We need to pay them a lot of money. Well, this did not sit well with the, um, with, with the evangelicals in Virginia. And what I'm pointing here is a petition from Westmoreland County. Um, these evangelicals write, let's see, that assessments are against the spirit of the gospel. The holy author of our religion did not require state support. Christianity was far purer before Constantine first established it by human laws. And here they specifically reject this argument that we need to pay clergy a lot of money. They said, no, no, no. Clergy should manifest to the world that they are inwardly moved by the Holy Ghost to take upon them that office, that they seek the good of mankind and not worldly interest. Let their doctrines be scriptural and their lives upright. Then shall religion, if departed, speedily return, and deism be put to open shame, and its dreaded consequences removed. So no deism here is a boogeyman. If we want true religion to flourish, we need to get the government out of the business of religion, and then we'll have flourishing true Christianity. So precisely because they cared so much about the church, they wanted the government to get out of this business. This evangelical petition was written in the same context as Madison's far more popular, far more um, famous now, uh, Memorial and Remonstrance. We oftentimes treat that as an Enlightenment text, but Madison makes arguments similar to the evangelicals. Um, he quotes the Virginia Declaration of Rights, that we have a right to religious liberty, uh, because what is here a right towards men is a duty towards the Creator. Madison goes on to argue that ecclesiastical establishments, instead of maintaining the purity and efficacy of religion, have had a contrary effect. And Madison specifically says this bill is had, the bill is adverse to the diffusion of the light of Christianity. Now Madison might have been saying some of these things for rhetorical effect. I think, think we can admit that. But that he thought this would be rhetorically effective tells us a lot about Virginia's um, political culture. It's noteworthy that we, we all know, if you know any of these petitions, you probably know Madison's Memorial Remonstrance. That was signed by 1,500 people. The evangelical petition here that I quoted to you was signed by about 4,500 people. So about three times as many people as signed Madison's petition signed this very evangelical petition. So there's a consensus. It's growing. And that is that, really, we should have establishments if they help Christianity. But many people are concluding to the same conclusion that, it, that, I, would raise, that, I, that I would raise today, the same sort of argument. We do not want the state to establish churches because that hurts Christianity. If we want Christianity to flourish, we should get the state out of that business. All right, well, what about religion in the public square? Here, um, again, there's, there's a pervasive myth that the founders attempted to create a wall of separation between church and state. Um, this metaphor, of course, comes from Thomas Jefferson, a letter he wrote to the Danbury Baptist in 1802. Um, one wonders why we go to Jefferson. He didn't help draft the First Amendment. He didn't help ratify the First Amendment. Um, I think the reason is pretty obvious. Justices were looking for a usable past, and say that they latched on this letter. Now, the easy case I can make is I can say, well, if we look at the broader constellation of founders, we see that Jefferson is very much of an outlier, and that's true. But what I want to argue, I want to take, again, a, maybe a harder position. I want to say this metaphor doesn't really even um, represent Jefferson's views all that well. It might represent his ideals, but not necessarily his practices. So let me give you a few instances from Jefferson's life. Um, Jefferson, as governor of Virginia, issued a call for prayer and fasting. And in, in his revisions of Virginia's law, he drafted a bill that stipulated when a government governor could appoint uh, days of public fasting and humiliation. He also drafted a bill to punish disturbers of religious worship and Sabbath breakers. Um, Jefferson was on a three-person committee to come up with a national seal. Here is what he proposed. Um, this is an artist's rendition of it from later. But basically he said, this is quoting his, um, what he wrote, his description, that it, it should contain the image of Moses extending, extending his hand over the sea, causing it to overwhelm Pharaoh. And the motto of the United States should be rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. Jefferson closed his second inaugural address by encouraging all Americans to join him, quote, in seeking the favor of that being in whose hands we are, who led our forefathers as Israel of old. And this is a wonderful um, coincidence, I think, two days 
literally two days after he wrote the letter to the Danbury Baptist, he went to church services in the U.S. Capitol building where he heard John Leland, the great Baptist itinerant minister, and himself an opponent of religious establishments preach. Think about that. Jefferson, right after he writes the letter to the Danbury Baptist, goes to church services in the U.S. Capitol building. And as president, he also permitted the War Department and the Treasury building to be used for church services. What I'm trying to suggest is not at all that Jefferson was an Orthodox Christian and not at all that he wanted a union between church and state. Um, he wanted a greater degree of separation than most founders. But even Jefferson, at least in his practice, didn't act as if there was this high and impenetrable wall of separation between church and state. Um, if we turn from Jefferson to the rest uh, of um, the founders, we see a very different picture. And I'll just illustrate this in one way by looking at the first federal Congress. We um, could, and I, I do in my book, go into a lot of other ways. So this is a, a very significant body because it's the very body that drafted the First Amendment. All right, so what did this body do? One of the very first things it did was it agreed to have legislative chaplains and military chaplains. And then a few months later, they agreed to pay these chaplains. Madison was actually on the committee that selected legislative chaplains. Um, shortly after selecting chaplains, it reauthorized the Northwest Ordinance, which held that religion and morality and knowledge are necessary for good government. Again, one of these wonderful coincidences is that it's almost impossible to make up. On the day after the House approved the final wording in the Bill of Rights, Elias Boudinot, later president of the American Bible Society, he said to his fellow representatives, I'm going to paraphrase him, he said, hey guys, things are going well. We should ask President Washington to issue a Thanksgiving Day proclamation. Well, even back in this era, there was always dissenter. So Adonis Burke of South Carolina stood up and said, no, we cannot do this. That's a European practice. And we don't want to copy the Europeans. Roger Sherman, the old Puritan from Connecticut, and here I'm quoting from a newspaper account, um, he responded to Burke. He justified the practice of Thanksgiving on any single event, not only as a laudable one in itself, but as warranted by a number of precedents in Holy Writ. For instance, the solemn Thanksgiving and rejoicing which took place in the time of Solomon after the building of the temple was a case in point. This example he thought worthy of Christian imitation on the present occasion, and he would agree with the gentleman who moved the resolution. The House agreed with Boudinot and Sherman, the Senate agreed with the House, and George Washington agreed um, to issue this wonderful Thanksgiving Day proclamation, which I encourage you to read if you haven't read it or haven't read it recently. I, I was going to quote some of it, but I don't think I will. Just go home and Google it, George Washington, Thanksgiving Day Proclamation, 1789. So wonderfully uh, theologically rich proclamation. So think about Sherman's argument just for a minute. Adonis Burke said we shouldn't have these things because they're European customs. Sherman said, no, 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 they're biblical. They're Christian customs. And so therefore, it's very appropriate for Christian people to have these sorts of things. He's making biblical arguments for this practice. George Washington agrees and issues this wonderful Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving Day proclamations. Presidents, pretty much all presidents, have routinely issued these sorts of proclamations. Our current presidents continue to do this to the present day. Jefferson, it's true, did not. He thought that both the first and the Tenth Amendment prohibited him from doing so. Uh, but as I already quoted, he sometimes invited his fellow Americans to, to join him in prayer. Um, Jackson did not as well. Madison clearly didn't want to, but he did anyway. And I think being in the War of 1812 had something to do with that, but for calls for prayer and fasting or, or Thanksgiving Day proclamations. All right, so where am I going with this? Well, let, let me emphasize um, that it's clear that America's founders did not want a national church. The Establishment Clause does mean something, right? It's also clear that they were comfortable in having um, the, the church and the state cooperate in a variety of ways. Now, some of this cooperation might be appropriate back in an era where basically 100% of, of Americans of European descent are Christian, but today, of course, we're a far more diverse and pluralistic country, and so, so some of what might have been appropriate back in the 18th century might not be appropriate today. But these are things we should debate as men and women and not fall back on some sort of inaccurate, made-up account of America's founding. All right, so by way of concluding, um, I would suggest, and I have to concede, that history is messy. There's different intellectual influences at work in the founding. There's practical influences, right, just like there are today. But I think an excellent case can be made that America had a Christian founding. Now, this might sound somewhat um, 
exclusive, right? Well, what about non-Christians? What about people who have no faith at all? Um, I want to suggest this is actually very good news for them. America's founders, particularly when they did things like come up with the scheme of religious liberty, they understood, they debated, and they understood that this applies for all citizens. It applies to all citizens, Christians, non-Christian alike. One of my favorite letters from this era is um, a letter George Washington wrote to the Hebrew synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island. Now, keep in mind, there's only about 2,000 Jews in America at the time, and they are not strategically placed. Um, this is not a constituency that you have to kiss up to. Um, Washington wrote a, um, a, a, this wonderful letter. Let me read two paragraphs because they make two very important points. All citizens alike possess liberty and conscience and the immunity of citizenship. It is now no more that toleration is spoken of as if it was by the indulgence of one class that another enjoys exercise of their inherent natural rights. Note again, Washington saying we aren't doing toleration here. You have a natural right to worship God according to the dictates of conscience. For happily, the government of the United States, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. The letter closes with this. May the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants while everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree, and there shall be none to make him afraid. May the Father of all mercy scatter light and not darkness in our path, and make us all in our several vocations, useful here in his own due time and way, everlastingly happy. The thing I love about this letter, there are several things. First of all, I love that Washington is writing to this tiny non-Christian minority and saying, you too are full participants in this constitutional order. And you have the right to worship God according to the dictates of conscience, just like everyone else. I mean, it's a beautiful sentiment. That last paragraph, some of you might have picked up, there were nine separate allusions to scripture in that last paragraph alone. None of them would have been caught by Donald Lutz because Washington didn't include little parenthetical citations. One of the scriptures cited was Micah 4.4, Washington's favorite verse. He paraphrases it over 40 times in a variety of letters, public and private. And so this shows, I think, even as Washington is saying, look, religious liberty is for all, he's also saying religion doesn't have to be kicked out of the public square. It's perfectly appropriate for a president to cite scripture, um, to use scripture, to issue Thanksgiving Day proclamations, and that sort of thing. Um, so to conclude, I, I would want to emphasize that I do think America had a Christian founding, but I do not think it was founded as a Christian nation. America's founders were influenced by their Christian ideas, and ideas that developed within the Christian tradition of political reflection to create a constitutional order that really benefits everyone, Christian and non-Christian alike. Thank you very much. So Professor Hall has agreed to ask, to answer some questions. Yes, sir. Given the strong evangelical influence uh, to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, the Republic, how do we reconcile the criticism from liberals about how Christians tolerated, did not respect the rights of the slave? I mean, how do, how do you reconcile the Christian commitment to the equal rights for all men, but then we're accepting of this slave trade? Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent, excellent um, question. It's a question I was going to address with two others in the conclusion of my book, but I said to my editor, you know, I really could write a whole chapter on this, and so I'm going to have a, a sequel to this book that will have a, a have a, an entire chapter on this. But can, can I attempt to answer it a bit, though? Yeah, no, I, I, but it, it, because it's a very good question. So first of all, in arguing that America had a Christian founding, I am not arguing that these were perfect Christians that they had somehow figured out everything and fixed all the problems at once. And so I think it's very fair to critique them, um, particularly those that continue to support slavery. I will say that a number of founders were coming to find slavery to be very, very problematic. Um, it, it was, of course, eliminated in about eight states between 1776 and the early 19th century. Now, these were northern states, to be sure, but up, upwards of 100,000 slaves were free because state laws changed and slavery was ended in 
in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania and Connecticut and that sort of thing. Um, so there is this sense that slavery is, is problematic. I think most people in the 1780s thought slavery was unsustainable. It's an institution that's going to die. It's going to just fade away. So it's unprofitable. Um, Eli Whitney really screwed that up by inventing the cotton gin. And slavery then became very, very profitable in the South. And then the South became all the more committed to the institutions, uh, the institution of slavery. Yes, sir, go ahead. Can I just a real quick answer to follow up question? Sure. In your research, um, how did the evangelicals who supported the institution of slavery reconcile that defense with the defense of slavery with evangelicals that um, would contest that? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. So um, first of all, there, there aren't tons of evangelicals in the late 18th century America. There's some, the Baptists and the Methodists, uh, that came about basically because of the First Great Awakening. But most of the Christians I'm talking about, the Calvinists, are Congregationalists, Presbyterians, people we wouldn't usually call evangelicals. Evangelicalism really takes off in America in the Second Great Awakening, the 1820s, 1830s. And alongside this is a whole host of reform movements. And so these evangelicals are the driving force behind the abolitionist movement. And so I think this is, you know, when the evangelicals really become active and engaged in politics, they're fighting to fix things. But not just slavery, they're fighting against the Indian removal in Georgia, uh, trying to protect the rights of the five civilized tribes. I, I've gone through these petitions. They're beautiful. One thing that's beautiful about them is many of them were signed by women. And women, of course, weren't really all that politically active. And so the petitions would begin like this. Well, we know we're women and we shouldn't be involved in politics, but this is such a grave injustice that we have to speak out. And so literally, these petitions signed by thousands of women uh, uh, opposing Andrew Jackson in the, in the Trail of Tears um, are all over the place. So yeah, I think evangelicals, when they get involved in politics, are, um, yeah, they, they, they hate slavery. They oppose slavery. And um, of course, we ended slavery with the bloody civil war, not reform, but it didn't have to go that way. But yeah, it's a, it's a very good question, and I think it's a fair point. So please don't hear me as saying that America's founders were perfect in every respect, or even practically perfect. You know, they were flawed human beings. Some wanted to ban slavery. Some would have been perfectly happy to ban it in the Constitutional Convention. But I think they recognized that if a Constitution had come out of Philadelphia banning slavery, no state, probably south of the Mason-Dixon line, would have ratified it. And so, you know, well, at best, we might have ended up with two countries with slavery being all the more entrenched in the South. So I think they, um, they thought it was evil. They thought it was going away. Um, the Northwest Ordinance, which I referenced, banned slavery in the Northwest Territory, right? And so again, that was part of putting it on the path to extinction. As America expands, we add more states, there are gonna be free states. There was a hope that, would, that it would just fade away. I think it's fair to say. Yes. Yeah, I've heard that sort of thing as well, and as well maybe um, our whole system of federalism being somewhat like a Presbyterian model of government. Um, I'm not really sure. You know, I, I think you, you can trace these to all sorts of different origins. So I, I would not make that argument myself, but I've definitely heard very serious people make that sort of suggestion. Yes, sir. It, it seems like our jurists, at least Supreme Court jurists, um, believe the Constitution is evolving, and it doesn't really matter what the original founders believed. How do you address that? Yeah, well, of course, there's different types of Supreme Court justices. I would say there's five excellent conservatives on the court right now that I think they take the Constitution seriously. And, you know, of course, usually they'll begin with the text, but if the text of the Constitution isn't clear, then they look at the broader context. They look at how the provisions would have been originally understood. Uh, but of course you're right. You have ju ju jurisprudential liberals who just are kind of making it up as they go along. Now what's interesting in this area of law is everyone does still insist that history matters. So even your most liberal justices will make historical arguments. So part of my project here is to make these arguments untenable. So they, they just have to be honest. Justice Stevens, whom I really don't like as jurist, is actually intellectually honest in, in these matters. Um, there was a uh, uh, an establishment clause case. I forget the exact um, the exact matter before the court, but I remember what he said. 
He said, well, yeah, sure. Uh, under the original understanding of the Establishment Clause, this would be permissible, but I really don't like it, so I'm just going to say it's impermissible. So that's kind of a good, a non-original sort of thing, right? He's saying, yeah, we have a living, evolving constitution. And so even though, say, presidential calls for prayer and fasting are clearly constitutional under my reading of the Establishment Clause, um, if you're a non-originalist and you're making it up as you're going along, you can just say it's unconstitutional. If you can't tell, I find non-originalist um, jurisprudence to be very unpersuasive. Uh, but nonetheless, some people do embrace it. Yes, sir. I hear you say that there are four justices on the Supreme Court who don't take the Constitution seriously. Oh, that's maybe a little unfair. Um, certainly, conservative views would say they don't take the Constitution seriously. Um, so, really, I, in what manner or fashion don't they take it seriously? Well, they're not originalist. I would say that. So, they don't go and rely upon the text and the context of the Constitution. They talk about all sorts of other things. So a good example of this might be the Bladensburg Cross case, the two justices dissenting there. I don't think there's any way in the world you can possibly get to a constitutional argument against the Bladensburg Cross case if you rely on originalist understanding of the Establishment Clause. But if you rely on sociology and talk about how, or psychology, in a bad form of psychology, how people might feel offended by a cross, how they might feel they're not part of America's constitutional order, you can get there. So in that sense, I don't think, that, you know, to be fair, they're not original. They're not originalists, uh, but I think I know, I know they would say they take the Constitution seriously. So, are the people, the five people that you say do take the Constitution seriously, are they somehow divining the intent of the uh, writers of the Constitution? I don't think anyone really talks about intent anymore. It's more a matter of original understanding. So, we go to the text of the Constitution or provision. We try to understand what that means. Sometimes it's quite clear, right? You have to be 35 years old to be. President, we all know what that means. And we might not like it. We might think a 33-year-old should be able to be president. But the Constitution really is quite clear on this subject. Um, if, if the text is not clear, what is cruel and unusual punishment? That's hardly crystal clear. An originalist would say, OK, let's go and understand what that would have been understood to mean at the time. And we're bound by that. And so someone like Scalia, you know, he sort of admitted, yeah, you know, this is real problematic because you know, if Oregon were to adopt thumb screws as a matter of originalism, I probably um, couldn't declare it to be unconstitutional, but I really, really don't like it, right? Well, in the case of the Second Amendment, at the time they were talking about muskets, they weren't talking about AR-15s. Sure, and I think the um, Constitution, of course, is wonderfully vague in that respect. Um, when they wrote the Interstate Commerce Clause, they weren't thinking about flames, trains, and automobiles. But I think any originalist would say, yeah, that's broad enough to allow Congress to regulate trains, planes, and the automobiles that are going between state boundaries. Yeah, I think the right to bear arms. Yeah, there's all sorts of arms that have come about that weren't there. But there's still arms, right? We know an AR-15 is an arm, a shotgun is an arm, and so forth. Uh, yes, indeed. No, there, there's problems with it, to be sure. Yes, sir. Well, one of the problems is that the uh, Bill of Rights And in fact, the way the First Amendment is phrased essentially protects some shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, protecting the, uh, the established churches such as they were. Perhaps there were, you know, there was a movement, as you say, eventually to disestablish the churches. But the idea that, that uh, the, the framers of the First Amendment wanted some sort of strict separation. Allowed the states their own choices as to how to uh, strike this balance. So the only way we can pursue the separationist position is by using the Fourteenth Amendment to incorporate the First Amendment, which uh, is difficult to justify anyway. So. Yeah, no, that, that's a you know, wonderful argument with which I have sympathy. So Keel Lamar and others have made this argument that the Establishment Clause is simply and solely a matter of federalism. It's telling Congress that it cannot interfere with the state establishments. And as such, it's uh, it, it just it's a matter of principle, unincorporable. It just makes no sense to incorporate it. I tend to think there must be some substance to it that um, it seems to me clear that it would prevent Congress from um, creating an official church of Washington, D.C. 
or an official church in the territories or something like that. So I'm inclined to say it does have some substance. And so if we buy the doctrine of incorporation, we can say the substance now applies to the, to the states. I'm willing to grant that. I would just say, basically, the First Amendment means what it says. We aren't going to have an established church. There are all sorts of other ways in which church and state might choose to cooperate. Um, some of those are prudential. Some of those are imprudential. We should debate those like men and women. Let me just say real briefly, this is one reason why metaphors can really sort of screw up the law sometimes. The words of the Establishment Clause go one way. They cut one way, right? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Only Congress is restricted. There's no way you can read those words to restrict the activity of the church. On the other hand, the metaphor of a wall of separation, walls work both ways, right? A wall of separation would seem to suggest indeed that the government can't interfere with the church, but also that the church can't interfere with the government. And I just don't think you can get there from, again, a textualist or originalist understanding of the Establishment Clause. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so Catholics were just outright banned from some of the early colonies, and disabilities on Catholics remained, um, you know, well into the 19th century. A number of states had um, religious tests for office that would exclude Catholics. Really, we didn't have what we would think of as public schools in America in the 18th century. In some of the northern colonies, what they would do is they would have legislation that would basically require people in a town to... Um, to hire a teacher to teach kids so they're literate and this sort of thing. And you do have widespread literacy in, in the North. Not a lot of Catholics in America, very, very few, you know, about 2%, mostly concentrated in the mid-Atlantic colonies in Maryland. Uh, but even in Maryland, Maryland eventually a, a adopts the Anglican Church as the official state church of Maryland. Uh, by the end of the Revolutionary Era, I think particularly because France helped us out, Catholics were regarded, you know, they were tolerated, at least. And generally, their, their, the restrictions on Catholics holding office were removed. This changed in a massive way in the 1830s, when you started getting these great waves of Catholic immigrants from Germany and Ireland. And you started getting a lot of really scurrilous publications about what goes on in convents and all this horrible stuff. And a lot of concern that Catholics just simply couldn't be good American citizens. Um, but nonetheless, the number of Catholics keeps growing. And then after the Civil War, when we really start getting to what we think of as public schools, basically they're public Protestant schools. The King James Bible is read, um, religion is taught, and the Catholics say, fairly enough, hey, we want to have our own schools. Give us our share of the tax dollars so that we can have our own um, Catholic schools, or at least let us read the Duye version of the Bible to Catholic kids instead of the King James uh, version of the Bible. This, this re, these very reasonable requests were met with, with a call for the separation of church and state. Um, this is the era of the Blaine Amendments, where um, James Blaine of, uh, of Maine proposed an amendment that basically would be restricting on the states, unlike the First Amendment, saying that no government money can go to sectarian schools. But what you need to recognize is by sectarian, they meant Roman Catholic, not Protestant. My great state of Oregon, if I could just say this briefly, we went so far as to ban all private schools in 1922. Every single private school in the state, with one exception, was a Roman Catholic school. This was a clear anti-Catholic measure. Fortunately, the Supreme Court overturned that. So yeah, I, th I think there is, um, this is an important part of the story, but it's actually a part of the story that comes more in the mid-19th century and continues right up to the present day. I, I think um, the sort of anti-Catholicism um, really lies at the heart of a lot of modern separationism. When I'm a, in a... Um, I, 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 what's the exact word? I don't know. When I want to cause a little trouble and I'm debating someone from Americans United for Separation of Church and State, I just debated a fellow named Steve Green, who's a law professor, who was many years with this organization. I will sometimes accidentally call the organization by its original name, Protestants and Other Americans United for Separation of Church and State. <laughs> a very anti-Catholic organization, as you might imagine. It reached its heyday in the opposition of John F. Kennedy's run for office. So that was a long-winded answer to your question, but thank you for that. Um, let, let me go back here, and then I'll go back to you, okay? Yes, sir. Uh, 
Yeah, no, I think that's right. Federalist 51, if men were angels, government wouldn't be necessary. But men aren't angels. And so he goes on to explain the importance of separation of power, checks and balances. Uh, Madison and one of, I think, Federalist 37, looking back at the Constitutional Convention, he basically said, there's no way we can understand how this uh, succeeded without the divine hand of providence. I'm paraphrasing, that's not exactly it. Yeah, Madison is, is educated by a Presbyterian minister uh, as a boy about whom he later say, said, all I have ever accomplished I owe to this man. He then went on to study at the Presbyterian College in New Jersey, now Princeton, under John Witherspoon, the great uh, American, well, Scottish-American theologian. Yeah, I think, um, you know, he's, he's very, very private about his religious convictions. Um, but he clearly has, a, has an understanding that humans are sinful or self-interested. Um, it certainly is possible, as I conceded, one could come to that conclusion for any number of reasons. But when you look at Madison's um, young life, anyway, and his education, it seems to me a, a pretty obvious source of that would be the, the, the Calvinism in which he was swimming. Um, yes, sir. Um, you made a reference earlier about the tradition of some presidents allowing church services be held in the capital. Um, I'm not clear as to when that church, when the last time was there a president allowed that. And would there be any constitutional grounds to deny a president from allowing that tradition uh, to allowing a church service at the capital again? I'm not naive. I realize it'd be pretty yeah. pushback, but are there any constitutional provisions to deny or prevent that? Yeah, so it was probably Congress that allowed church services to be held in the, in the Congress building. Jefferson did have control over the War Department building and the Treasury Department building, and he permitted them to be used for religious services. Um, this practice continued well into the 19th century. I, th I think it, um, it sort of tapered off in the mid-19th century. One major reason for it, I think, and particularly for Jefferson making available the two other executive uh, buildings, is that Washington, D.C. was being built from scratch, right? There just weren't that many large places where people could gather to worship. And so that's why they had them there. And that's probably why eventually, as Presbyterian and Methodist and Baptist churches are built in D.C., um, they had worship services there instead of um, the U.S. Capitol building. Yeah, and no, I certainly don't think there's any bar whatsoever for Congress allowing its facilities to be used for religious services. Of course, we still have. We've had ever since pretty much the first days of the new federal government to the present day, uh, a chaplain for the House of Representatives, a chaplain for the Senate, um, legislative meetings are open in prayer. And one of the great ironies, of course, is when the U.S. Supreme Court meets um, ever since 1827, it's open with a prayer, right? God save the honorable court. Um, again, all these things are, are not problematic from an originalist understanding of the Establishment Clause, but some of them, I think, and I actually go out of my way in my book to say, look, we live in a very pluralistic, diverse um, nation today, and we should be very careful. So the idea that we could um, build, that we should build a hundred or a forty-foot giant cross to memorialize the dead from the Iraqi War, I, I think that's a horrible idea, right? Um, it it might have been appropriate in 1925 to memorialize dead from a particular town in Maryland, most of whom were, would have identified themselves as Christian. But today, of course, many of our brave servicemen and women. Are, are not Christian, or at least some of them, and we it would just be offensive to memorialize their death with a Christian symbol. Yes, sir. Um, so we talked about what you said earlier about the historical and societal gap between what Washington considered tolerance to be in terms of um, in terms of his understanding of the school of what we consider tolerance to be now. So you said that Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. So I think, um, as I was trying to make the point, what's it? Oh, the question is about tolerance in the 18th century versus tolerance today. And um, one, one of the important points I tried to stress is that I think the founders were viewing tolerance as something that's not strong enough. You know, tolerance from the Latin, tolerare, means put up with, right? And the idea is that, okay, you know, we're going to put up with people. And Madison said, no, 
We have a natural right to worship God and to act according to our religious convictions. Keep in mind, it's a free exercise clause. It's not just that you get to believe what you want. You get to act upon your beliefs. Now, of course, religion can't be an absolute trump card. It can't win every time. We're not going to allow an Aztec to sacrifice a baby to sun god, right? So there has to be limitations on it. Um, but I, I, I do think that founders had a very robust understanding of religious liberty. Um, and again, I already ta told the sordid um, tale of anti-Catholicism in the 19th to 20th century. Um, so I don't want to paint too weakish of a version of religious liberty. But I would say by the 1960s, 70s, the country had come to a consensus that religious liberty is really, really important. The liberal William Brennan came up with a wonderful test for judging religious liberty claims. He said, look, as long as someone has a sincere belief, um, that person gets to act upon that belief unless the state has a compelling interest in keeping him from doing so and um, does so in the least intrusive means. That's a pretty nice standard um, for protecting religious minorities, and it's almost always religious minorities who run afoul of the law, because by definition, majorities protect themselves pretty well. Unfortunately, in 1990, the U.S. Supreme Court abandoned that case, um, Oregon versus Smith, and said, oh, the uh, law just has to be neutral. Well, that's a much lower standard. But guess what Congress did? In 1993, passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, 97 to 3 in the Senate, unanimously in the House, signed into law by President Bill Clinton. So again, that's just evidence that I think we had arrived at a national consensus to say religious liberty is really, really important. Unfortunately, I would say over the last 15 years, there's been a, a kind of move away from that. People are writing books with titles like, Why Tolerate Religion? Or Is Religion Special? Um, you know, you know, the Obama administration really um, gave religious liberty very little um, priority, I think it's fair to say. And uh, when Indiana and Arkansas tried to pass Religious Freedom Restoration Acts a few years ago, a firestorm, a national firestorm broke out. Um, whereas in 1993, there was almost complete unanimity that it's a good thing. So I, I fear for religious liberty. I, I, I think that it's being um, de-emphasized, devalued today. And that it's something that we should all fight for, really. We should take into account in our voting decisions and uh, perhaps even consider donating money to some of these legal advocacy groups that are out there on the front lines fighting for religious liberty every day. Yes, ma'am. Well, I was just going to add one thing. I was going to comment on our young student over here that the overlay of my mindset, my definition of Christianity, evangelical, whatever, is so far different than what was going on, you know, 200, 300 years ago that I think that the framework that we have to look at it is through a lens of, well, you could talk about intentionality, what you talked about earlier, but I'm always a little bit fearful of, I'm not going to just say my mother, but um, <laughs> people who will have the argument that says, no, how we behave now must be the same as how they behaved then, and therefore, you know, uh, shut up and vote this way. I think that my biggest fear right now is what we're dealing with in our country is a misuse of our Christianity and our religious rights to develop a kind of crazy nationalism and patriotism that I think runs exactly against what our founding fathers were doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good that's a good caution. So I, I, as a Burkean conservative, uh, my favorite definition of conservative is someone who believes that his ancestors are at least as smart as he is. And so I think we should look to the wisdom of the past. But any conservative worth his or her salt would say we, we change. Obviously we change. But we should do so slowly, gradually, incrementally. Um, my originalist approach to this, and I hope I made this crystal clear, I think all sorts of things are permissible as a matter of establishment clause laws law, that would be horrible ideas, that are bad ideas that we ought not to do, right? And I think what we need to do then as free and democratic citizens is we should debate um, the wisdom of placing, say, a monument of the Ten Commandments on the Arkansas State House grounds as they recently did, right? Clearly constitutional in my way of thinking, but we should debate that. And, you know, there's all sorts of arguments that could be made, right? Uh, at least that sort of monument has a virtue of being more or less um, acceptable to Jews uh, Protestants and Catholics, right? And they use a variation of the Ten Commandments that don't clearly fit into one of uh, either of those traditions. 
Um, you could say that symbols have multiple meanings and the Ten Commandments can stand for the importance of law and that sort of thing. Uh, but then other people might say, look, this is just a, a silly act. It's going to be divisive. Some people who are atheists or Buddhists might feel left out and so we ought not to do it. Yeah, let's have that argument. Absolutely. And just doing something because it was done um, 100 years ago is, is never a good argument. I agree with that. Yes, sir. So I just have to say, I love that our country allows me to live my faith the way I do. Now you give me a reason to read some more. So my question is, I do have another book, and I want to know how your book compares to John Beeson's American Gospel. Is it the same? Are they argumentative? Two different thoughts? But I know they both deal with our history and Christianity. Yeah, that, that's generally a pretty good book. Um, he does what a lot of... Um, People is doing a radio interview and they're asking, you know, if I'm right, and you got all these people making um, inaccurate claims. Most of the founders were deists; they wanted a godly constitution. Um, why is this? And one of my answers was, it seems to me that um, a lot of people think anyone can just sit down and write a book on the on religion, the founding. So John Meek Meekham is a journalist, right? He's not an expert. He hasn't spent deep time in the sources. And he has limited time. So he went and he looked at five or six um, elite founders who are very important, um, but they're also all Anglican, with one exception. At a time where about 15% of Americans are Anglican, 50 to 75% are Calvinist. He extrapolates from these, and some of the things he says about them are accurate, but then he overgeneralizes from a faulty sample size. And so I think he does make some mistakes with respect to the influence and the enlightenment in the era, the number of Americans who were deists, and that sort of thing. Um, this fellow Waldman is a very good journalist who just recently came out with an excellent book on religious liberty. But he also just makes some blunders. He says Madison opposed presidential calls for, um, for prayer and fasting. Um, he opposed them for Je Washington and Adams, and he didn't issue them himself. Um, it's, it's just a highly problematic statement. Uh, there's no record that I know of that Madison opposed Washington and Adams issuing presidential calls for prayer. As president, Madison actually issued four himself. I mean, he clearly this is, done, this is a historical fact. There's no debate about it. He might not have wanted to do it. Um, Congress requested that he did it, but he did it nonetheless. Late in life, after he left the presidency, in an unpublished document, he wrote, well, maybe that was unconstitutional. I should not have done it. Well, that's kind of interesting. But again, it doesn't, um, it, it's not the definitive word on the constitutionality of such things. And it also doesn't um, really reflect what he actually did as president. So that's a long way, winded way of saying, I don't believe I have a monopoly on truth about these questions. There are other good books out there that make very good points. Um, and the book you mentioned is, I would say, I balance a good book. I even assigned it in class once and used it quite profitably. Yes? So um, the question of religious Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. I'll, I'll, I'll get around to it in a minute. But let me mention in, in the various proposals for what became the First Amendment, um, a lot of them contain language both protecting the free exercise of religion, but also the rights of conscience, which I rather like because that then clearly would protect um, convictions that an atheist might have. The founders did end with uh, protection just of religious liberty. There's other protections but in, in this area. And I think what they meant with respect to religion are sort of what we all intuitively know if we aren't trying to be sophomore or high school students. Yeah, it's an individual's relationship with a, a superior being. Obviously, in their context, their context, they're primarily thinking in terms of Christianity and Judaism. Um, in the ratification debate, so, anti-federal is brought up 
the, the reality that, look, a Muslim could become president under Article 6 of the Constitution, and the Federalists had to say, yes, that's right, that's, that's a possibility. So clearly they understood that Islam was religion, uh, Buddhism, Confucianism, and that sort of thing. Unfortunately, the U.S. Supreme Court and other courts have generally been very differential. They've said, if you say you're a religion, you're a religion, all right? There are a few exceptions to that, um, and that's where you have these sort of obvious parodies, the uh, Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. There was a case where a uh, federal district court judge, I think it was a year or so ago, actually said, um, this isn't a religion, and this is not a question of theology, it's a question of reading comprehension. And I think he's right. I mean, you go and read what they say about themselves, and it's, it's clearly a parody, and you look at the origins of it, it's not religion. But almost always, judges will say, if you say it's a religion, we'll treat it as religion, and then decide um, if there's a compelling reason to keep you from acting upon a religious conviction. Did you want to follow up? I just wanted a clarification. So you mentioned that they could have um, possible appointment as president, but Muslims would still be atheists. So yeah. is there any indication of the founders being aware of non-theistic um, religions or only considering atheists um, explicitly under that? Yeah, so I think the answer to that, is, as a matter of originalism, is no. That the it, it is simply um, bad jurisprudence to say that the First Amendment free exercise clause protects non-religious convictions. Fortunately, very fortunately, oftentimes legislatures protect it. In the era of conscription, though, um, Congress has been quite clear. Um, the Selective Service Act of 1917 said basically if you're a member of a historic peace church and object to war, um, all wars, you get to do non-military service. In World War II in 1940, that was changed to a religious pacifist. So any religious pacifist, but still religious. Um, there was a federal court judge that had to deal like 1947 with the case involving a non-theistic pacifist. And he said, well, it's kind of like, it's kind of like religion, so I'll go ahead and Congress did not like this. So they came back and defined religion in the Selective Service Act as a man's relationship with, um, with, with God. To this day, the U.S. Code only permits religious pacifists to avoid military service. There were, was a series of, of cases of statutory interpretation in the late 60s, early 70s, where the U.S. Supreme Court, in my mind, just said, I love the result. I think non religious pacifists must be protected. But the court basically said, well, these non-theistic convictions are similar to religion, so we're gonna treat them like religion. But I think that was just bad statutory interpretation. So I hope that makes sense. I think non-religious convictions absolutely must be protected, but I, I think, again, as an originalist, I don't just read the First Amendment to say whatever I wanted to say. I think it clearly favors religion. The first Congress considered broader language that would protect conscience more broadly. They rejected it. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Religion is specially protected in the First Amendment. Yes, yes, oh yes, all right. Yeah, perhaps. So the question was about originalism and how this can be reconciled with broadness. I think some parts of the Constitution are very, very specific. You have to be 35 years old to be president. Right? That's, that's, that's not broad at all. It's clear. I think everyone can agree what that means. Um, when it comes to Congress's powers in Article 1, Section 8, some of them are given in very broad language. Congress has the power to regulate interstate commerce. 
And of course, what they're primarily thinking of is ships going from one state to another, wagons going from one state to another. But I think it, it takes, um, it, it's a very reasonable reading of that provision to say as technology evolves and now we have steamships and now we have trucks, that the passage of these, these new vehicles from one state to the other can be regulated under the Interstate Commerce Clause. Now, here's what I would say, though. I, I think sometimes Congress and, or the Supreme Court, well, both Congress and the Supreme Court, take this in ridiculous sort of direction. So there's a famous case, Wickard versus Filbert, where the, um, the Federal Agricultural Regulatory Agency told a farmer that he could not grow, grow grain, a certain amount of grain on his own land for his own consumption. And he argued, wait a minute, Congress, you have no authority to do this because this is not by any definition uh, interstate commerce, right? It's not commerce between states. It's remaining within one state. But the U.S. Supreme Court basically said, well, you know, um, it, the impact of this guy growing some grain and eating some grain or giving some grain to his cows will have this impact on interstate commerce because he won't buy the grain from somewhere else that might have come from another state. And so this, um, this clause has been stretched beyond any reasonable re meaning of the words or the understanding of it. Let me just say real quickly why I like the um, originalism. It's because I believe in democracy. I believe in republicanism. I think many decisions have been left up to us, the people, to debate, and then our elected representatives to pass laws about. So let me give you an example. I hate the death penalty. I hate it. I think it should be abolished, absolutely abolished. Okay? The, the uh, uh, an originalist reading of the Bill of Rights does not permit me to reach that as a conclusion um, for what the Eighth Amendment means because the Fifth Amendment provides for the death penalty. It says a person's life can be taken if there's due process of law. Well, where does that leave me? Well, it leaves me with making arguments to my state legislatures. Look, Oregon, let's, let's repeal the death penalty. We don't have to have it. And um, you know, we can have these debates, and people will disagree with me, and that's fine. But I think that's how our country was, was, um, was designed to work. Now, sometimes when the Constitution is clear, certainly the Supreme Court can step in and declare an act of the state legislature or Congress to be unconstitutional. But I think it really has to be quite clear. And the problem with non-originalism is it can become really squishy. And if you're sort of having these unelected, unaccountable justices, being amateur sociologists and psychologists and economists, um, they're substituting their wisdom for the wisdom of our legislatures. And I think that's problematic. Um, one last question, and then we'll... I think that this will be the last question. Okay, just so you know, I used to drive around leaving crazy, too. Okay, all right. But uh, this is in regards to your earlier reference about how the states did away with the religion tests uh, for office or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so this is probably a controversial question. But didn't the federal government weigh in on this and say we have the right to set some standards in regard to this because of the Judeo-Christian a commitment to Judeo-Christian principles? Didn't they make this clear as a precedent when they told the Mormons, when they put their Christians or standard, ah, you guys practice polygamy, and unless you do away with polygamy, you're not going to get admitted. And then they had a convenient revelation. Oh, we're not going to practice it. Can we get in now? Doesn't the, doesn't the federal government have the right to say, we'll honor the tradition of tolerance and we'll allow uh, uh, gays to practice their type of marriage, but doesn't the federal government have the right to say, no, our definition of marriage is one man, one woman. And we can, and the recent Supreme Court uh, decision, you know, went against that. But doesn't the federal government have the, the, the right to say, this is our definition. If you don't like it, tough. We'll tolerate, you know, whatever lifestyle. But we have the right, constitutionally, to establish this as the standard. Sure, so you've opened up a whole bag of worms, federalism worms. I'm not sure we'll be able to go there um, right now. Let, let me just say, with respect to religious tests for office, the U.S. Constitution clearly bans um, federal tests for office. Some people have actually interpreted Article 6, just like the way um, was suggested earlier, maybe being a protection of the state religious test. Clearly the way it played out is states decided for themselves what they wanted to do, usually getting rid of it until the U.S. Supreme Court finally um, came around and said, oh, all the remaining tests, religious tests um, for office are unconstitutional. I think it was 1961 or so. 
So the federal government did eventually weigh in, but it was the judiciary, not Congress. So thank you all very much. So I think there are still some unsold books uh, out there, and uh, you know our speaker is here. He's, uh, you can uh, talk with him and ask him to uh, sign your book. So uh, join me one last time in uh, thanking Professor.